Let me offer another word of welcome to the number of uh, guests we have today. We're delighted that the Lord's brought you our way, and we pray that you'll be blessed for having passed this way today. Don't even forget to get this out of here before you be away. <clears throat> and I take that off because there's no one sitting within 10 feet of me, so I hope that you'll not be jeopardized in any way by that. For those of you who are visiting, we are in the early stages <clears throat> of a um, sermon series through the book of Colossians. And today we've come to these uh, two verses, 16 and 17 of chapter 1. There is uh, an outline in your <clears throat> bulletin if you care to take notes. Uh, if not, just ignore it. But let me encourage you again to give attention, close attention, to uh, this reading of God's holy, inspired, infallible, <clears throat> inerrant word. For by him, that is by the Son, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is the word of God, which is flawless, like silver, refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. Pray briefly with me once again. Father, at this uh, critical time in our worship, when we turn to your word, we pray for the critical presence of your spirit, asking again that you would come and make us true worshipers as we give attention with our ears and submission with our hearts to your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus seem, people seem all, almost everywhere to be eager to demote Jesus. Jesus in line for a big demotion at the hands of a lot of people these days, seeking to reduce him somehow, uh, to downgrade him, to uh, miniaturize him, to shrink him or something like that, um, into something that would be perhaps, I suppose you could say, more manageable, a more manageable reality. Scripture trumpets him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but people have always been eager to say, well, now, just a minute, not, not quite so fast. Jesus may proclaim, I am the way. And the world says, well, Jesus, you may be a way, but there are, there are lots of ways. Jesus may have confirmed the marriage mandate of Genesis 2 when he quoted it approvingly, saying, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. But our sin-loving culture says, well, that was a long time ago. Jesus was a long time ago, and Genesis was a long, long time ago. Doesn't the Bible say that love is the main thing? The greatest of these is love. That's what it says. And so I'm sure if Jesus were here today, he would also approve when a man leaves his father and mother to be united to another man or a woman to another woman. My Jesus, the world would say, understands it's all about love. Well, your Jesus, that Jesus, is a miniature. But lest you and I, as church-going Presbyterians, feel too smug about things, get to feeling a little bit superior, then consider this one. Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And of course, we've all been taught to understand that means to die completely, to die to self, to surrender entirely to Jesus. But practical-minded church folk would say, daily? Well, I can, I can give you an hour on Sunday. 
or maybe maybe two hours, except that Sunday the time changes, or maybe during March Madness or something like that. You'll understand. You'll understand. Daily? I've got a lot going on. So the tendency is everywhere. There's nothing new about it, this idea of demoting uh, Jesus, minimizing, miniaturizing him. In fact, the years immediately following his earthly life and ministry, his death and resurrection, there were a number of heresies that sought to demote Jesus. One said maybe he was just a, a man, just a really special man, but a man nevertheless. Or maybe he was a created being, uh, a super angel, perhaps. And as we see, we'll see, Lord willing, over in Colossians 2, the Apostle Paul warns against such demotions, against such distortions at Colossians 2.8, where he writes, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Against those tendencies to demote Jesus, to shrink him down, whether they're ancient or modern, the Word of God here in Colossians 1 paints us a full-length portrait of this one who is our Lord and Master, an accurate depiction of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the portrait has shown us much about him already. Verse 14, we learned that in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Verse 15a, he is the image of the invisible God. Verse 15b, he is the firstborn over all creation, that is, specially honored, first and only Son over all creation. That much we've seen. Now, today's text adds additional truths about Jesus. Verse 16a, by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. Verse 16b, all things were created by him. Verse 16c, all things were created for him. Verse 17a, he is before all things. Verse 17b, in him all things hold together. A most impressive list, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? Last time we asked and tried to answer the question, who saved you? Today the question is, who made you? The catechism for younger children is as charming as it is informative. You know how it begins, who made you? And the answer comes back, God. The second question, what else did God make? God made all things. Sound doctrine. Put in little bite-sized pieces for our very youngest children. And all of it true. But lest we should linger too long on this uh, milk of the young spiritual infants. We will seek to move ahead a little bit today to something a bit meatier, thinking more deeply about uh, this question, who made you? Well, we don't have to think long, really, because it could not be said any more plainly if one tried. Jesus Christ made you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, made you. It's stated twice in our text, verse 16a, for by him all things were created. Are you part of all things? Well, yes. Then you were created by him. And then the same truth is simply turned around in its construction. Verse 16b, all things were created by him. Who can make a human being like you? Who can make the stuff of which a human being like you is made? God alone. God alone made you, as our children know through their children's catechism. It was a divine action. But now we this morning move along to say, more specifically, the second person of the Godhead made you. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, made you. And that is our profession. That is our statement of faith. Now, I'll admit to you right now, friends, that I do not have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't have enough faith to believe that there is no creator God. If I were to take that position and say that God did not make this universe and everything in it, including you, including me, it seems to me that I would be reduced to two basic options. Option one, I'm reduced to saying that matter is eternal that the basic material from which everything that has been made 
is made has always existed. That it, it existed eternally in and of itself. It was just always there. That it is the greatest reality. But that saying, of course, is not really atheism, because with that belief, matter becomes God. Atheism means no God. But with this materialistic view, you still have a God. What is God? God is the thing greater than which there is no other. We would say God is the one greater than which there is no other. And in this materialistic theory, matter makes that claim. Whatever is greater than anything else is God. And now you're saying that eternal matter is before everything, constitutes everything, controls everything. Well, then you're saying nothing less than that matter is God. Everything is matter, and matter being eternal is the thing greater than which there is no other. That is God. And therefore, everything being matter, everything is God. So what you really have here in this position is not atheism, but it's a form of pantheism. God in all things. Matter is controlling. Matter is the greatest reality. Matter being eternal. That's option one. Now option two, the only other option I can think of left to the atheist, is to say that everything came out of nothing. Either matter was always here, the greatest reality, or there was a time when there was no matter, and matter came out of nothing. No particular cause, no particular reason, just a, some kind of spontaneous event. There was absolutely nothing. Can you envision that, conceptualize that, imagine that? Absolutely nothing. And then suddenly, there was everything. Or at least enough of something to get the ball rolling toward everything. And as I say, I just don't have enough faith to believe that. My limited faith requires me to believe that something had to be there to create everything, or I should say, someone. And now I know that someone was the Son of God. That someone was Jesus Christ. But we've already been told. I read earlier from John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. To state it from a negative, without Him, nothing was made that has been made. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word who is God, the Word who was there in the beginning, made all things. And then when He had made all things, because without Him nothing that was made has been made, this Word became flesh, became a man, lived among us, tabernacle here among us. It's the beloved Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting to note here, and fully consistent, that Genesis says that God did not create anything except by His Word, that the only method God used was to speak reality into being, speaking His creative Word. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters. God said, let the dry ground and seas exist. God said, let there be plants and trees. God speaking reality, His works into being. Why does He do that? God creates by His Word. And now we know that Word is His Son, the Word who was there in the beginning, that Word through whom all things were made. So, first John, and now the Apostle Paul teaches that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, created all there is. All things were created by Him. Some try to say that Christ didn't exist until that starry night in Bethlehem. But the Bible says, no, Christ has been, all, been there all along. He was there in the beginning. Others try to say that Christ was one of those beings that God created. But the Bible says, no, Christ is the one who created all things that have been created. Obviously, he did not create himself. How would that work? All things are created by him. Jesus Christ, whom we have proclaimed here today as Savior and Lord, is the creator of all things. No demotions allowed. 
Secondly, all things were created for him. What does that mean? That means that they were created for his glory. They were created to glorify him. The children's catechism comes through for us yet again. Question three, why did God make you in all things? Who made you? God. Why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. When we were students in Jackson, Mississippi, we attended and worshipped and ministered a little bit at a little church out in the country. And there was a little child, I can't remember the kid's name, but uh, she was learning the children's catechism. And the organist and a very prominent figure in that church was a woman named Gloria. And she got her, 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 her identifications of the, 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 the organist and her catechism mixed up. And she began to call the organist for his own Gloria. <laughs> for his own Gloria. God made you in all things for his own glory. The creator God is not only the source of all things, we're told here he's the goal of all things. That God himself is the ultimate end for things that have been created. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. That's who I am. No demotions allowed. All that has been brought into being has been brought into being for Christ. That is brought into being, created to display the greatness of Christ. Nothing. Nothing in this entire universe exists for its own sake. Everything from the bottom of the oceans to the top of the mountains, from the smallest particle to the biggest star, from the most boring subject in school to the most fascinating science, from the ugliest cockroach to the most beautiful human being, from the greatest saint to the most wicked genocidal dictator. Everything that exists, everything to make the greatness of Christ more fully known, that's its purpose. And that includes you. And that includes the person whom you find the hardest to like. You and all these things exist for God's glory. Jesus is determined that the excellences of his being and power might become manifest, not only so that we might know him, but also that he can be worshipped in a worthy manner. And since God alone is worthy of worship, Jesus Christ, our creator, is the true eternal God. Man's chief end is to glorify him and enjoy him forever. And next we learn that Christ is before all things, verse 17a. And of course, this is true, for since he created all things, he must necessarily have existed before they existed. He not only was before Abraham, as Christ claims in that memorable exchange in Luke, in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am, but he was before all things. From the beginning, there was anything that was that exists was created after he was already on the scene, being eternal as he is. In the book of Proverbs, the one whose name is Wisdom speaks and says this, says, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Jesus Christ is that wisdom. Wisdom is the Son himself. And now our author, the Apostle Paul, having given to the Lord Jesus the glory of creating all things, goes on to show that it is he who preserves all things. Verse 17b, in him all things hold together. What does this tell us about God? This tells us that this God is no impersonal, disinterested God. Nothing here of that proverbial divine clockmaker who sets his masterpiece in motion and then walks away. The creator is always there. Close at hand, preserving, maintaining, involving himself with his works. The Bible teaches this at a number of places. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the Son upholds the universe by the word of his power. The Son sustains the creatures he's made, those all like us who depend on him continually, so that as Psalm 104 confesses to him, when you hide your face, O Lord, they are terrified. Creatures like us are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. And so here we have additional proof, as if we needed any, 
that he is the true God, the eternal one, blessed forever with the Father. The power to preserve this universe, which no man has seen or will ever see, and which the astronomers tell us is continuing to expand, this universe is held together. All things held together by the Son of God, belonging to no one but God. Now, let's back up a bit and think about those things which the apostle mentioned specifically as being among the things the Son has created. Verse 16, again, second part. For by him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. This is an exhaustive list, comprehensive. Nothing is omitted. All things included, no matter where they may be found, in heaven or on earth. And by heaven, he does not mean simply the sky where birds fly and storms blow. He also means paradise, where angels live, where the souls of men reside. But of all these things, that God has made, the millions of things that Paul could have mentioned that Christ made that exist for his glory, he chooses specifically to mention these, thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities. What are these? These are the ranks of angels, the various divisions and species of these spiritual beings, good angels, which Paul cautions even they should not be worshipped. You can see Colossians 2.18. Since they themselves are created beings, they're not to be worshipped. Good angels included, but also bad angels. Look at Colossians 2.15. That's where Paul celebrates Jesus' triumph on the cross. And he says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So here are the powers and authorities that he referred to back in our own verse, Colossians 1.16. They turn up again in Ephesians 6.12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities. They are, Paul says, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. They are evil spiritual powers that aim to deceive and to destroy the human race. They have been decisively defeated at the cross where Jesus disarmed them. He has made his people eternally secure through faith in him, but they still are capable of much mischief. They do much harm in the world because not all people are Christ's people, and even those who are can still be hurt by them, can be hurt by them, but not destroyed by them. Now, why? This is a lot of information that we've thought of together, but the question, why? Why would God want us to know that Christ who made you, who created all things everywhere, even these thrones and powers and rulers and authorities, why would he want us to know that the one who created you in all things sustains and controls all that he's made? Let's think for a moment about the benefits of knowing who made you. In his treatment of this material, John Piper mentions five reasons. Five benefits, and I'll close with these. The first benefit of knowing Christ made, knowing that Christ made you, is that it's the truth. And it's always a benefit to know the truth. It is objectively true, not merely opinion, not merely an idea. Like the, the seat you're sitting on is really there and really real. God knows the truth, and He wants you to know the truth. His word says people perish. Uh, for lack of truth. So surely you see that it's a benefit to know the truth. The second reason, the second benefit is for you to know whom to worship. Whom should we worship? So these truths make clear that Christ is the only one worthy of worship. The triune God, of course, Christ being the second person. There are people among us, people among the Colossians, saying that Well, the worship of angels was part of the way up to God. And no, Paul says these angels are created beings. They're created by Christ and for Christ. Don't worship them. Worship the one who created them. There's benefit in knowing whom to worship. The third benefit of knowing who made you is that it will protect you from heresies. We've reviewed some of these most outstanding, basic, fundamental heresies the last couple of weeks. We live in a pluralistic 
intellectual, generally well-educated culture. We're not the first. The setting for Colossians was a pluralistic, intellectual, generally well-educated culture. And there's always a chance of being captivated in the culture like that, captivated by some kind of high-sounding heresies. That's the point of the upcoming verse we've already considered, Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. So with these great truths in mind, Paul is equipping us by the work of the Holy Spirit to be protected from these philosophies, from these traditions that do not cherish the supremacy of Christ. When you embrace truths like this, truths of Scripture, about who saved you, who made you, who is Christ, then you're not easily swept away by these man-centered trends or traditions. And there's a great benefit in that. It's an ongoing struggle in our lives. Fourth, knowing who made you informs you as to who is in charge. Paul wants to make crystal clear that when Christians who feel so small and vulnerable Christians who, like the rest of the world, can be swept up in the tumult of events that swirl around us. When we hear of these thrones and powers and rulers and authorities set against us, he wants people like us to know that they are, without any doubt, under the protective authority of Jesus Christ, and that these powers and authorities cannot do anything apart from his sovereign permission. And therefore, finally, Fifthly, Paul tells us these things because he wants us to see the salvation of Christ, to feel that our salvation in Christ is invincible. That is, that it is secure. When Christ died for sin and rose again, he disarmed the powers and authorities. That's what we read in Colossians 2.15. Have you put your trust in Christ? Are you out from under that ultimate threat of these powers and authorities? If so, here's what he says about you in Colossians 3, 3 and 4. For, your, for, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him. In glory. Believing friend, you are forever secure in Christ. So what? Where is the application? It is this. There is no miniaturizing one who is all these things. There is no demoting one who has done all these things, who continues to do all these things. That you, among all these things, were created by him and through him and for him. But we're not only to know it, and we're not only to proclaim it, although proclaim it we should, we are to let this knowledge work itself down deep into our psyches, into our hearts, into our souls, into our lives, so it touches all parts. What would be the result? We would love Jesus more. We would hate sin more. We would follow the Lord more closely. The effect would be that it would arm us against the temptations that we face. Do you face temptations in this world? Do you face temptations in life? Boy, I hope you do because I sure do, and I would not like to feel alone in that. How shall we defend? How shall we be armed against those temptations? By knowing who it is that made us and who it is that preserves us and who it is who has vouchsafed our eternal security. And these truths working themselves into our lives would comfort us in all of our afflictions. Who is on the Lord's side? That's what the hymn says. Whose side is the Lord on? That's what I might ask in a moment of 
affliction. When I'm on his side, he's on my side. And there's ultimate supreme comfort in that. It should assure us in the face of every fear that confronts us. If Jesus is the one who has created this grand universe, all things visible and invisible, even the thrones and powers, and if all of this that he's created continues and is held together by his controlling providence, who would not see that our devotion to him, our dependence upon him, our faith in him should not be partial, faltering, but should be complete. This ground you walk on, this air you breathe, the sun, moon, and stars which shine on you, these plants and these animals which feed us and delight us, these angels which Scripture says, although invisible to us, are camping out around around us for our protection. All these things come from his power. All these are gifts from his hand. And so our souls, our bodies would not exist, would not continue without him. So isn't it only right that we should devote to him and to his glory these things, all these things, all of these privileges which we have been given merely as an act of grace. Remember too what the apostle has said, that not only were all things made by him, they were made for him. So friends, let us not frustrate his purposes in this. Let us not frustrate his intentions. They were made for his glory. So let us live for his glory, because that's the reason that you were created. If the mountains and the rivers and the dumb animals can glorify him, what possible reason would there be for folks like us not to glorify him also? And that glory that he wants from us is that we walk in his ways. Walk in his ways. In the big things of life, in the little things of life. And that we abound in good works. The good works that are on display for the world to see and the good works which God alone will see. And that we keep ourselves from evil. That we defend against the onslaught. And that we, you and I, where we live, as we live, as we go about our business day by day in the common ordinary things of life, that we live such lives that our neighbors will look at us, look at us, and be compelled to say, yes, this Jesus whom they serve, this Christ whose name they bear, he must be a great God. He must be a great God. Let us pray. Father, you are a great God. Forgive us on those occasions too numerous for us to even acknowledge. We live as though it were otherwise. Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, come upon us that all that we do might be according to the truth and might redound to your glory. Amen. Please stand. Jesus shall reign where the sun doth his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and i
Jesus Christ, that great shepherd, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he equip you for everything good to do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Can't hear you.